Hello and welcome to another edition of Ignite News. I'm Alex Smythe. And I'm Josh Stewart. And it's the holiday season, which means toy drives. Reporter Han Vo takes a look at one of the largest. Merry Christmas, Josh. Oh, I wanted Skipper. The season of giving is just around the corner. Donations to nonprofit organizations are important at this time. Claire Wagner is the organization of a toy drive at Neighbor to Neighbor. So here at Neighbor to Neighbor, throughout the month of December, we work to get about 1,600 to 1,700 families support for the holiday season. So that's food, gift cards, treats, and then that's gifts for their kids, 12 and under. So right now we are out in the community trying to get support and have gifts raised. We do only accept new gifts. That's something that we prioritize. So we accept new unwrapped toys. And then what we do with those toys is we set up a toy store. So it's a site that we invite parents to come visit and through that toy store, we give every child a main gift, so something in the approximately valued at $25 to $35. And then we try to make sure every child leaves with a bunch of stocking stuffers, things like books and little toys, things that they can play with, and a few knit items as well. For our gifts, we find that we always get donations for children three to five. I think it's really fun to buy those toys. And so although we are grateful for all donations, we really need gifts for the other age groups, especially for girls ages from nine to 12. We always have a lot of trouble sourcing those gifts. So things like craft items, sports equipment, uh, fashion or makeup items. And then finally, gift cards are a huge help to us because then we're able to give the parent the option to either give that gift card onto their child to go purchase clothes or electronics, or you know they can go find a thing that fits their child well before the holidays come. Thanks to everyone in the community. Every year people come out and donate toys for us. And again, it's new unwrapped toys that we're looking for. And we're trying to get enough so that we can distribute them to 1,500 children over the, the next month so that they can have a brighter holiday season. You can donate at 28 Athens Street on Monday to Friday from 9.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. On Thursdays, 9.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm Han Vo. With the holiday season approaching, the Good Shepherd Center is gearing up to help those in need over Christmas. Brother Richard McPhee says the generosity of giving from Hamiltonians has been outstanding. Uh, we're opening our Christmas store. Uh, we'll see some 3,000 families that'll come to the store this Christmas season. And most of this is because of the generosity of the community of Hamilton. People have given of their time, but they also have given their resources. And many, many corporations and individuals have donated to make Christmas a reality for so many people who are in need in our community. The Good Shepherd has been helping create these realities for many years, but how imperative has the center been in Hamilton? Oh, it's community. extremely important because just like you and I can go shopping and pick out gifts and whatever we need to celebrate Christmas. So these folks need to be able to do it with dignity and respect. And this Christmas store provides an excellent opportunity for so many families. The work that the Good Shepherd does wouldn't be possible without the help of countless volunteers. And Alan Whittle has nothing but praise for those who come in to help others. Volunteers are pretty critical. I mean, today we have about 95 volunteers that are going to be here working out front and in the back sorting clothes and food and toys and those kinds of things. And we rely upon that many every day for this operation. And throughout the year, we rely upon maybe perhaps not that many every day uh, for our food programs, but certainly a large number. So uh, volunteers are a critical part of what we do here. These volunteers say they're happy to do their jobs and are passionate about working for the Good Shepherd. I think this is one of the most important things for the people who come here. The Good Shepherd produces, provides services to this community which are not available anywhere else. The Good Shepherd's Christmas store runs until Monday, December 22nd. Donations can be dropped off at the Venture Centre at 155 Cannon Street East in Hamilton. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm John Rich. Okay, Josh, let's play some word associations. So what do you think of when I say swarm? Bees. <laughs> well, don't worry, Josh. It, swarm can also mean art. And Alex Sempe has a story. Hamilton Artist Inc. is proud to reveal its new exhibit, Swarm. Swarm features a variety of Hamilton artists who proudly display their work. 
So this is a Swarm, a Hamilton Artist Inc.'s annual members exhibition. And so it's an annual show that we've put on for the last 40 years. We're celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. Um, and so it is. it features about 110 artists this year, um, but basically it's an open exhibition where all of our members are invited to bring in a piece and then it's unjuried and we just put it up on the wall. Um, it usually happens around the holiday season as well, which is really great because it gives um, the artist a chance to, to have a kind of uh, saleable time period, pertinent time period uh, to sell their work. Um, and so, yeah, so everything here is also for sale, and all of the proceeds go directly to the artists. We're not taking a commission on them. Uh, yeah, we've sold a handful of pieces. It's been pretty good. The first night's always kind of like the initial sort of exciting night, but there's been, yeah, there's been a fair amount of interest still, so it's good. It's kind of a nice gift around the holiday season. Uh, well, typically we actually, as an artist-run center, we try to encourage artists to make work outside of a commercial or marketable kind of sense. Um, and so it's not, we don't generally take a commission, um, but in this case, it is nice for the artist to have a chance to focus on being able to sell their work if they're interested. Some pieces in the show also aren't for sale. Like it's, it is um, also an exhibition opportunity. Um, so yeah, we generally don't take a commission. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm Alex Sempe. The city of Hamilton has begun a big push to make the city more livable. Recently, the Beasley Neighborhood gathered together to plan for the future. The Beasley Neighborhood Association is asking residents, community partners, and supporters for their opinions on the strengths and weaknesses of the neighborhood. A drop-in consultation was held at the Beasley Community Center to consider what the Beasley Neighborhood Plan would look like. BNA member Matt Thompson says the plan focuses on diversity and inclusion, health and well-being, parks and recreation, and neighborhood safety. So the role of the BNA today is to really figure out what's going on in the neighborhood, um, how to bring people together, how to let people know about what's going on in the neighborhood, and then also figure out what matters to the neighborhood. So if you look at the neighborhood plan, you know, we're talking about how to make the neighborhood great in the next five years. Um, that, that takes a long time to put that together. But once you have that, once you have that plan, then you can say to the people who are making decisions, to the people who have resources, this is what we want to see. What we want people to do is we want people to say not only this is where, you know, this spot here is positive, so this is great for my health, also this spot here feels unhealthy. I feel like I belong here, I don't feel like I belong here. So we're taking both the positive and the negative. Derek LaPierre is the chairman of the Hamilton Skateboard Assembly. It's important because uh, the city listens to the BNA, and so if we're part of the BNA, then the city listens to us. And pretty much uh, anything that is good for the HSA, as far as lights at the park and uh, new concrete and the community being involved in the new Beasley renovation stuff, that's, that's BNA stuff. All, all, they would be doing that if there was no HSA. Dale McNevin is an advocate for the homeless in the Beasley area. I want to show you something. This is only a block, two blocks away. Now, in that same spot, this man right here, I found dead. And one year later, almost to the day, his brother died on the streets three blocks away. So, yeah, we have some things we need to help each other with. Feedback about the Beasley neighborhood can be left at www.rbeasley.com. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm Jessica Sovi. Recently, Christiana Machado and I got the unique opportunity to travel to the Anatomy Lab at McMaster University, where health, wellness, and fitness students get hands-on experience working with the human body. Let's take a look. We're one of the only colleges that do provide this opportunity to the students. Uh, in a previous career, I actually had the opportunity to work with cadaveric specimens as well as participate in labs such as this. And I knew firsthand that the ability to get in and have exposure to an opportunity like this teaches you mar far more than in one hour than I could do in an entire semester. The student response has been overwhelmingly that they have thought this was a phenomenal experience. Hey, this was a mind-blowing experience. I'm really grateful actually that I had the chance to, to come here. I know coming into it there was some apprehension, not quite knowing what to expect. Um, and I understand that. It's certainly an experience not many people ever get in a lifetime. 
but once they get in here and have opportunity to talk to the lab staff and spend time with the different specimens and see the the structures and the uh, different features that we've been learning about they are leaving here with such a deeper understanding of anatomy than when they came. I think actually it, it helps you learn being here because it's an experience in and of itself and there's an emotional component to it so that helps you internalize the information quite a bit better I feel. I'm a very visual learner so like I feel like this helped me more than it would have than just reading a textbook or just seeing videos. Andrew is so knowledgeable though when he was going through the different parts of the cadavers that was actually really informative too. Like the first time I ever came into a wet lab like this I was anxious, I was nervous. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world seeing cadaveric specimen but pretty quickly once kids kind of start to get their hands in things and and really kind of get a sense of what it is they really you kind of lose that anxiousness and you just kind of get excited about it and you realize that it's a great tool to actually learn anatomy from. A lot of students you talk to if they've studied only out of a textbook for most of their life and then they kind of come in here it, it, you kind of kind of see that moment where they they get it. Hopefully this will carry them through into their final exam now and get them through the home stretch with this little bit of extra experience and opportunity. Mohawk College has a variety of arts and crafts designed by the students. One thing that is missing though is glass blowing. Let's take a look at an award-winning local glass blower. Glass blowing has been around for thousands of years through an age-old process of heating the glass, cooling, twisting, crimping, and of course blowing, artists are able to shape and create beautiful pieces of ornate glass. Although modern technology has improved some tools of the trade, glass blowing is still a difficult vocation. It requires strength, creativity, perseverance, and the ability to work in extreme heat, especially in the summer months. The unique skill set, coupled with the high cost of material, has left the medium with very few practicing artists. Kelly Lowe is one of the few. Lowe has been blowing glass for 18 years. I got interested in blowing glass because a friend of mine was an doing an apprenticeship with a glass blower up in Penetang where I grew up and he always talked about it and stuff like that and I thought it was really interesting. So when I saw glass blowing offered in the course calendar at Sheridan I thought I would try that. I had no idea what glass blowing was really all about until I got there and I was terrified because it was hot. Um, but it was really exciting and it was I don't know, it's an interesting medium, it's totally different than anything else I'd ever done before. Lowe has a cold work studio and gallery in Stony Creek, where she puts the finishing touches on her retail glass creations, as well as many awards and commemorative sculptures she creates for corporations and organizations throughout Hamilton, including Mohawk College. I used to work for Shirley Alford, um, who created the Juno Awards, and I got to make them with her, and I got to make some of them myself when she was sick. Um, and it's a job that has gone a different direction, but it's always something that's been in the back of my mind that I would love to approach the Juno people and design my own Juno. <laughs> because I loved the piece that Shirley made. Um, I loved that it was a piece of art made by a Canadian artist for Canadian artists. With half of her life invested in this unique and demanding art, Lowe still enjoys its challenges and most of its rewards. I don't think I would really change anything about the way my career went, except for maybe to have more money. <laughs> Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm Jimmy Goldenberg. Alex, both you and I know that I love sports. In fact, that is a basketball. I'm very impressed. You know that is a basketball, Josh. Congratulations, you get full points for that. And speaking of basketball, our varsity team just wrapped up their final games until the break. So why don't we take a look at how they did? What looked to be a blowout turned into a nail biter. The Mohawk men's basketball team put their undefeated streak on the line against Sheridan College Wednesday night at the D-Bark. The Mountaineers surged ahead early. Led by forward Kojo Afari, Mohawk went up 8 to nothing. But after an early timeout, Sheridan was able to right the ship and play even the rest of the first half. Going into the break, Mohawk led 45-37. The Bruins kept the pressure on in the third, cutting the lead down to three. And early in the fourth, a short jumper by Brian Owusu gave Sheridan its first lead, 71-70. The game seesawed from then on, both teams hitting key shots throughout the quarter. With the score tied at 90 and seconds remaining, Mohawk guard Kareem Collins drove to the hoop and was fouled by Sheridan guard Dylan Periani. Collins sank both free throws and forced Periani into a turnover on the ensuing possession to preserve the victory. 
After the game, head coach Brian Jonker was relieved to get the win and hopeful that the hard-fought battle would keep the team focused moving forward. It's a game of runs, so we, we, I mean, we were happy with the way we played to get the, the 10 or 11 point lead we had, but um, they made some good adjustments against our zone and got some open looks and they, they made some threes, so um, I was just proud of us, the way we were resilient enough to come back after they got the lead again. You play one of the top teams in the country and uh, anytime you can get a win like that, regardless of how it happened or by how much, uh, it, it definitely gives you some confidence. We just got to make sure we uh, we don't look past our, uh, you know, we got three games left this semester. We can't look past any of them. With the win, the Mountaineers improved their record to 6-0. Reporting for Mohawk Journalism, I'm Jimmy Goldenberg. The Mountaineers will head into the winter break with a 7-2 record. The team dropped their second game in a row, falling in five sets to the Niagara Knights. Uh, it sucks to lose in five, but uh, boys battled pretty well. and. I think we put our best on in the third and fourth set, and uh, fifth we just fell a little bit short, so it's pretty good. Uh, the way we battled in the fourth, I think that was really the way that we have to play. Every point's uh, game point, and that's, that, that's the way we got to play from now on. The Christmas break cannot come soon enough for the Mountaineers. We put a lot of energy into those first matches, and a lot of we had a lot more planning time ahead, and so we kind of just had to come in here and just put everything we had like we were looking forward to the end of this first half going in eight and one but unfortunately we didn't squeeze that out and so now we get a rest and we're just going to prepare for the second half as best as we can. Coach Matthew Schnarr wasn't happy with this team's performance but he thinks they can play better. I hope so or it's going to be a long second half. Uh, we're not physically the best team in the league, but we have a lot of guys that can play volleyball. And if we don't execute what we're trying to do on a nightly basis, that's what's going to happen. We're going to keep coming out on the end, uh, end of losses. So um, I hope they take a break and when they come back, they understand why they're actually in the gym. Uh, because right now I think some guys are taking this game for granted and uh, it's becoming pretty clear. So if they're not going to make their uh, mindset different, then uh, I'll make it for them. The Mountaineers will have a chance to redeem their loss to the Knights in the new year when they travel to Niagara College. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm John Rich. Into their Tuesday night contest against Fanshawe, the Mohawk men's basketball team was just two wins away from a perfect semester. In front of their home crowd at the D-Bark, the Mountaineers jumped on the Falcons early. Forwards Kojo Afari and Jeff Hunt were unstoppable in the paint. Guards Kareem Collins and Lamar Barr consistently beat their defenders to the hoop. And Hunt led the way on defense, contesting and altering Falcon shots. I just wanted to step it up and have a better first quarter and first help my team out a little bit more defensively on both ends and offensively. And it ended up working out for us tonight. Played with a lot of energy. All the guys were ready to go from the start. Mohawks 37-20 lead after one allowed coach Brian Jonker to extend his player rotation. Reserves Adrian Aknoa and Brace Abea provided quality minutes for the Mountaineers in the second. Mohawk maintained a double-digit lead, 59-46, at the break. Fanshawe did their best to get back in the game in the second half, but any time they made a run, Mohawk forward O.J. Watson put a stop to it. Whether it was a lay-in or a power two-handed dunk, Watson had the answer. His seven third-quarter points helped push the Mountaineers' lead to 87-63, going into the final period. Jonker emptied his bench again in the fourth, and everybody got into the act. Second-year guard Stephen Deli hit two outside jumpers to the delight of his Mountaineer teammates, and Mohawk went on to win 115-85. After the game, Jonker spoke about the start of the season and how he feels about his team moving forward. It was nice today to get everybody in there and, and get a good run, and uh, we got to do lots of different things. It was nice. You know, in my 11 years here, we've never had a perfect semester. So, that, I mean, it's right in front of us right now. It's one game, uh, two nights to prepare for it, and an opportunity to do something that we haven't done. And, I mean, we've had some pretty good teams here. So to not have done it before and, and these guys have that opportunity, I think it's exciting. The difficulty engaging it in comparison with what we've had is that we're, we're so different. Like we're smaller and a lot more athletic and having to play a different way. Um, so it's hard to gauge. But at the same time, um, I think the sample size okay. is large enough. I mean, we've played uh, 13 games against Canadian college teams. We haven't lost any. So uh, I haven't had a team do that before. So we must be all right. The Mountaineers travel to Niagara College Friday for their last game of the year. They start back January 2nd playing in the George Brown Invitational Tournament. Reporting for Mohawk College Journalism, I'm Jimmy Goldenberg.
Welcome back. So I'm now joined by our sports reporter, John Rich. So John, the varsity teams are now on holiday break. So where do they currently stand? So Alex, the men's volleyball team, they were off to a hot start. Unfortunately, they're riding a two game losing streak right now. They were first in the province. They now sit at number four and they're ranked ninth in the country. So they've got to kind of step it up a little bit. The women aren't faring too much better, unfortunately. They are unranked everywhere. Okay. On the basketball side, the men, phenomenal job right now. They're 7-0, ranked first in the province and fourth in the country. And the women, they are riding a three-game winning streak right now to improve their record to 5-2. and two. So the volleyball teams, you know, they're kind of in a rut, as it were. So they're going on the break. They can kind of recharge, refuel. Do you think once they come back? They're going to be uh, better. They're going to be competitive. You know what? I've seen these teams play, and I have no doubt in my mind that everybody will do just fine coming back into the final stretch. Okay, well, thank you, John. So that's it for our sports. Now let's take a look at what else is happening in the community. December 6th is the National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women. The second annual men's walk was held at McMaster followed by a panel on missing and murdered Indigenous women and a commemorative service to honor Canadian women who have experienced violence. Kojo Dampty led the men's walk. He says that gender-based violence is a social justice issue that needs to be discussed. I'm one of the board members for the Ontario Public Interest Research Group um, here at McMaster. Uh, so sitting on the board, um, we were just asking ourselves, you know, what events can we have here on campus to uh, draw attention to the fact that men aren't involved when talking about um, issues of uh, violence towards women. So, um, so yeah, that's how it began. Uh, so this year was our second year of doing this. The Red Dress Project uses the visual of a red dress to represent each of the missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada. Valerie King and her family recorded an album in support of the women and their families. We knew that those songs were to uplift, mm -hmm. uplift the family and then the last song that came was for the women that were still missing mm -hmm. and because we knew what, where are they, you, know, don't, you don't know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. Some people are still looking for their their daughter for our mother for seven ten years yet according to the canadian women's foundation half of all women in canada have experienced at least one incident of violence by the age of 16. reporting for mohawk college journalism i'm jessica sovi it's been five years since an earthquake devastated haiti and while many people have moved on to other disasters and events, there is still one dedicated group of doctors who are working to help the people in the region. So John, this is your story. What can you tell me about it? Well, the group of doctors that are working there, they're from the St. Joseph's Health System International Outreach Program. They were doing work in Haiti before the earthquake. They went to Haiti directly after the earthquake. And they still continue to work in Haiti at a hospital called Centre Medical Baraka, which is in the northern part of the country. Sounds interesting. Let's take a look. And right now with the OP, we have nice room because of the work that the OP have to do with them. And so that makes a big difference here. And now we are in a very primary care hospital in northern Haiti, where we are basically trying to help the people to build their own knowledge, to build their infrastructure so that they can take care of the large population around them. The problem is you like to do many things and you can do many things but, and, and teach and uh, improve the, the patient care delivery, but if you don't have the infrastructure in place, then it's very hard to do. He said that there's, a, there's lots of changes. There's a big, big, very big, uh, a huge difference be, uh, like before the IOP came and yeah. after. Um, especially for the surgery room, it's, it's very, it's very, 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 very different because before it wasn't like that. But with the, with the partnership they have with IOP, 
they they made um, a great transformation into the surgery room, and it's very it's very it it, it, it becomes very modern. There is an operating room. There's two large operating theaters, which are working very well for general surgery and um, obstetrics and gynecology. These are the only two services of, of surgery that they can do right now. And we, the IOP, is working very hard right now to start an orthopedic service because a lot of fractures, a lot of injuries arrive at the door every day. Uh, at CMA, uh, uh, the maternity is a uh, very important service. Uh, uh, according to uh, the great uh, importance uh, of uh, maternal care, and uh, according to, to the number of patients uh, that we receive uh, in this hospital. The IOP has a, a working agreement with them to try and improve um, many aspects of functioning of the hospital and care, uh, particularly in, in, in women's health care, in, in obstetrics, in maternity care, and in other areas in trauma, orthopedics, etc. So I'll, so I, I was uh, been very work, working very closely with the other uh, the young obstetrician that that works there. He he's the only one there, and uh, so he he sees me as a as a mentor. Um, um, also, the, the training are very positive, and it helps them um, even if like, the, the the trainer or the is not there. They all like the surgery room staff. They can all. They, they can also continue to do what they learn. And the satisfying thing is that after we leave, we see that they work on things. Things don't stand still just because we leave. And that's it for this edition of Ignite News. I'm Josh Stewart. I'm Alex Smythe. See you next time.